Coming up on DTNS, a phone with a pop-up selfie cam on the side. Slack complains to Europe about Microsoft, and you can affect video game crowd noise using an app for real sports. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, July 22nd, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about those Microsoft earnings numbers that just broke on Good Day Internet. Uh, short version, Azure was a little weaker than you might have thought. Games were better than you might have thought. Uh, get that full conversation on Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Samsung announced the Galaxy Z Flip 5G. The foldable phone is mostly the same as the previous Galaxy Z Flip but with a Snapdragon 865 Plus processor and sub-6 gigahertz 5G radios. The Galaxy Z Flip 5G comes in gray and bronze and sells for $1,449.99. Ships it on August 7th, so not too far. Samsung will announce five more new products in its unpacked event on August 5th. Ah, more new phones. Motorola's Edge Plus, uh, only available for Verizon customers. But as of Wednesday, the company announced it'll start selling the fully unlocked Edge starting on July 31st from Motorola and several major retailers for 500 bucks down from $700. Both the Edge and Edge Plus have a 6.7 inch 90 hertz endless edge, quote unquote, display. Same stereo speakers tuned by Waves Audio and the Snapdragon 765 chipset. Apple released a study it paid for that shows that Apple's App Store has the same commission structure as other app stores like Google Play, Amazon, Samsung Galaxy, Microsoft, and gaming app stores for the Xbox, the PlayStation, Nintendo, and Steam. The study also looks at media platforms like Roku, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as e-commerce platforms like eBay, Etsy, and Uber. Most platforms, with the exception of a few like Epic Games, charge around the same 30% that Apple does. Super interesting they did that. Um, analyst Ming Chiku says Apple will include a periscope telephoto lens from Korea Simco in its 2022 iPhone. So you got a little ways to go. Periscope lenses like the one used in the Huawei uh, P30 Pro provide higher optical zoom in more compact form factors uh, suitable for more smartphones. Apple announced it'll start loaning special iPhones with more access to the device's operating system to skilled and vetted researchers to help find and report security vulnerabilities that Apple hasn't fixed yet. Uh, this is part of the iOS Security Research Device Program. The iPhones will have SSH access and a root shell to run custom commands and the highest access they allow to the software, as well as debugging tools so security researchers, uh, researchers can run their code and better understand what's going on on the phone. Apple says the devices don't pose any additional security risk if they are lost or stolen. They just have a little bit of extra access. AT&T sent out an email to some customers with an all-caps headline saying, Update Needed, which, you know, obviously induce some panic, adding that their device is not compatible with the new network and you need to replace it to continue receiving service. AT&T failed to mention in the email itself that this refers to the fact that AT&T will retire its 3G network two years from now. So any phone that relies on 3G to make phone calls, make voice calls rather, will stop being able to make those voice calls afterwards. Even some recent phones with 4G data use 3G for voice rather than voice over LTE. But folks with those phones still have until 2022 to decide what they'd like to do. Bad messaging. Uh, finally, after the information first reported, a group of investors were in discussions to buy TikTok from ByteDance. Ars Technica has two sources that say the venture capital firms General Atlantic and Sequoia Capital are leading an investment discussion with the U.S. Treasury, Treasury and other regulators to see if buying and firewalling the app from parent company ByteDance would satisfy U.S. concerns about the app's security issues lately. If the buyout went forward, ByteDance would reportedly keep a minority stake in TikTok with non-voting shares. All right. Let's talk a little more about what Twitter's up to these days, Sarah. Oh, a tiny little story. Uh, this actually it happened yesterday afternoon and, and is unfolding as we speak. Twitter announced on Tuesday that it would stop recommending accounts and content related to the conspiracy theory, 
theory, QAnon, which includes preventing related terms from showing up in search and also trending topics on the platform. Twitter says it's also taken down 7,000 accounts related to this theory for breaking rules on targeted harassment. It'll also ban related URLs and prohibit swarming of accounts targeted by the theory. Twitter based its decision in part on the U.S. FBI's investigation of QAnon as a potential domestic terrorist threat. On Wednesday, the New York Times sources said that Facebook may also be preparing to limit the reach of QAnon content in coordination with Twitter and also other companies with an announcement perhaps slated for next month. So I guess the question is, you know, what effect uh, does this have? Uh, And to know that, you would have to know what effect was this conspiracy theory having before? Uh, and and then if there's, you know, then there's a question of should Twitter have taken this uh, step and, and if so, why? Uh, it, it's, hard, it's hard to know the actual details on all of this. We don't really have any studies of what effect this was having. It's just anecdotal that people were seeing this and some spreading it. A lot of people spreading it are spreading it uh, because they're trolls, because they're, they they want to have a lark, because it's fun, and they want to cause chaos. Uh, other people sort of get caught up in it and, and maybe start believing it. Uh, so Twitter, I think, basing it on the FBI designation uh, of a domestic terrorist threat gives them a little leg to, uh, to lean on and say, well, it's not just us deciding it's something we don't like. It's something that an outside party uh, has decided is, is a problem, and so we're going to crack down on it. Yeah, the other, I mean, it's kind of, it's going to be hard to get heads around it entirely, but I would think also maybe another reason, and again, someone will find a way to to argue with this, I suppose, and this isn't controversial to say this, I don't think, but it's a pretty well-documented, provable, false narrative. You can actually go read up on tons of stuff that will point to lots of ways why this thing is wrong, and I'm just saying maybe that's what Twitter's doing. Maybe they're just saying, well, we have really well-documented evidence that it is purely conspiracy theory and nothing else so if it's dangerously being uh, held as a belief by people but we know that it can be proved otherwise well then we're safe and you know in in squashing some of this i still that think it brings you to the question of okay maybe you think this one is obvious but what about the next one right uh, where is that line where do they get to decide what is a provably false theory and what isn't well, and the whole idea of, uh, you know, accounts being created, you know, flooding other people's accounts with, uh, you know, misinformation that that the the group, whatever the group is, you know, quotes, put in air quotes here, uh, you know, th- Twitter saying, hey, listen, this is wrong. we got to take a stance. Here's what we're doing to combat this. Okay, well, that is definitely a stance. And the folks that uh, are passionate enough about this will figure out ways to change some search terms and change some profile pictures and change the location that they're tweeting from. And, you know, people will not necessarily be quelled by this. So I wonder a company like Twitter or Facebook, or, you know, those are sort of the two biggest social networks that we think of when we think of issues like this, you know, what do the companies have to do to ramp up this sort of thing in the future? Because there will be others. And this particular issue is going to morph into something. It's not just going to go away. Like this, this is not solved right now. And what you know, what does the company have to do as its corporate structure in order to, I don't know, hire a bunch more human moderators to work with the algorithm to make sure that they're at least, you know, attempting to be able to squash some of this that they've said that they want to. It's it's kind of fascinating and not in a good way. Now, to me, it's it's not about identifying it. I don't, I don't think the problem was the algorithm was letting it slip. It was deciding when it is a thing that isn't allowed. And Twitter is very has always been uh, very careful to say, we don't want to decide what people should talk about, except in very extreme cases. And this is now in their, I think because of the FBI designation, become something that they can, they feel they can justifiably say is an extreme case. I agree, but now that that has been identified as such now what happens that that was sort of the point that i was making uh like you're so you're saying you don't think that this will be enough to stop it from spreading absolutely not uh, it does and and it i don't think that companies should just say oh well we can't we can't control the masses let's not try i i think absolutely you should but i i don't I, I wonder what the next phase of this is all. I don't know. I, I, I want to give them a chance to to take the actions they're taking now and see how much the this stops it, because I, I feel it might be a little more effective than you think. 
It's like the Seinfeld line, censor the conspiracy to feed the conspiracy. All right, moving on. Uh, (laughs) Slack filed a complaint with the European Commission accusing Microsoft of anti-competitive abuse of market dominance for trying, or tying rather, Microsoft Teams to Office. So we're back in that stuff. Slack says this forces millions of Office customers to install Teams, blocks its removal, and hides the true cost. Microsoft has more than 75 million daily active users of Steam as of Mar- uh, Teams rather as of March. Slack has reported 12 million users in October. Yeah, I was, they I was sort of floored by how many more Teams users there are than Slack. Um, I I don't personally use Teams. I know it's very popular. And yeah, if you're already in that Microsoft ecosystem and bundled in with Office and being able to collaborate, that that makes a lot of sense. But still. I did not realize it was well over, you know, twice as many users. Although we don't have fresher numbers from Slack, so it may not be quite as bad. But also, Microsoft uh, is probably going to have more details on 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 its more recent quarterly Teams numbers, which are probably going to be bigger. So, however you slice it, folks, uh, Sarah's right. This is a big difference, and I, that's why Slack's complaining because they're saying, look. Teams doesn't have an open API that allows us to integrate with it easily. It has an API, but it doesn't do a lot. Uh, and they're bundling it in with Office, which makes people use it because it's free. And what Slack wants to do is force Microsoft to sell Teams separately from Office and say they're abusing their market dominance. You may say, well, why don't you force them to separate Excel or force them to separate PowerPoint? Uh, nobody's accusing them of, of using their market dominance to abuse the word processing space. Maybe they should, because uh, what other word processors have you bought lately? Uh, but Slack is saying it's an abuse of their position to bundle teams. It's not that it should be illegal for them to bundle teams. It should be illegal for Microsoft to use its position to come up with something we think is inferior to our product and drive down the usage of our product. That's also, what they're blaming. Also, always go to the European Union when you are looking for um, stuff done. Microsoft's abusing its <laughs> Lenovo announced the Legion Phone Dual. That's the one that I mentioned earlier with a pop-up selfie camera embedded in the side of the phone. The idea seems to be to get a view of your face while you're playing games on the phone. So I'm guessing Twitch streaming kind of stuff. It's a video game phone after all. Uh, Also has a 6.65 inch display with a 240 hertz sampling rate. I should, uh, I'm legally obligated to call that buttery smooth. Uh, Two 2,500 milliamp hour batteries that can be fully charged in 30 minutes over USB-C. Runs on the Snapdragon 865 Plus processor with up to 12 gigabytes of LPDDR5 RAM, 512 gigabytes of UFS 3.1 storage, and it's ready for the sub-6 gigahertz 5G spectrum. If you're like, what's the difference between sub-6 and millimeter wave? Check out knowalittlemore.com. It has two USB-C ports, one at the bottom, one on the side, opposite the pop-up cam. Ultrasonic sensors let you map virtual buttons to the edge of the phone so you can use it like a controller. The Legion Phone Duel is coming to China this month where it will be called the Legion Phone Pro, not the Duel. Uh, then it comes to select markets in Asia, Latin America, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Super interesting. Um, I'm trying to read into it a feature I want that it doesn't actually purport to have. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. But this concept of uh, mobile gaming becoming a more streamable effort is real. It's a real thing. And, and it's real because there are a lot of kids out there who are playing who would like to both stream and play but they just have phones to do it on. Now they'd have to get this phone to do this, but the idea that uh, millions and millions of people are playing, say, Fortnite on their phones is true, and some of those guys want to stream, so why not make that stuff easier? The feature I wish this was or had or maybe could still have is a way for me to turn that phone into a either Wi-Fi connected or just make it with a wire if we have to, but I want to make that a sort of usable webcam in weird situations. So if you just need to quickly get a setup going with a laptop and you're on the road and your phone's got that good camera in it, I want to flip that up and have the PC and OBS or whatever, recognize it for what it is and use it in that way. But I, that's true of any phone. Why would you want this particular phone to do that? Well, I guess the form factor is a smart one. Like having uh, it okay. flip that way and aim at you, I, I, they, they get into no detail about whether any of that's adjustable. But that seems more possible than me having to get a tripod, hook the phone up, get an angle just right. Because, yeah, you can do that. But it's not that quick flip, let's go kind of kind of process. So I'm really curious also about the virtual buttons because phones without controllers are terrible. 
uh, for most gaming. And uh, I, I'm really curious what they mean by that, like how those edges actually translate to decent control experience. There's a lot we don't know, but I'm, uh, it's a very curious move, and I think it's probably following some interesting trends. So let's see how it does. Amazon is launching a feature called Alexa for Apps in preview for its voice assistant app today that lets you launch Android or iOS apps using voice commands. Examples include telling the assistant to launch Twitter, then search for a hashtag, or launch TikTok, and begin a video recording. Developers would have to have skills on the Amazon voice platform to make this work. The company also announced an improved conversational model allowing more natural voice commands, skill resumption, so you can pause a task to check in on another, like perhaps a timer, and then a quick licks feature to help developers launch their skills from apps, websites, or ads. Yeah, so you can talk to your ad and tell it to launch a skill on your Amazon Echo, uh, which is something that the advertisers definitely want. I don't know if I do, but uh, to the to the main point here, I love this. I'm glad we're seeing more voice assistants get more capabilities because I would like a world in which I can just choose the voice assistant I think works best and not because I have, I've have i stuck myself with gadgets that only use it. Uh, but you can't, I don't think even on Android, certainly not on iOS, change the default voice assistant. Uh, you you have to, on iOS, use Siri. If you want to use the Amazon Voice Assistant, you have to have the Amazon Voice Assistant's app open. And I don't likely mm. see myself in a situation where I have that app open already and I'm now wanting to use it to launch Twitter or something. Yeah. I mean, you, uh, yeah, like that that's going to happen every so often, but not if you're just like, oh, this is a cool feature I have on my phone all the time. You'd have to think about it and be two steps ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm with Tom. Like when it's system level, then it makes perfect sense. But in in the case of of without that, what what I do is I just default to whatever that device's default voice activation is. So if it's an Echo, it's it's the A word. If it's my phone, it's Siri. If it's somebody else's phone, it's you know, okay, Google. Like all of these things work really well for. Well, not all of them, but some of them work pretty well for what they're meant to do. But when they're system level, that's when they're useful. If they're not, then it feels like just another gadget or app I have to open and use. And we got to get past that. Like we got to get to a point where search engines, where we have that kind of control. We say, I want DuckDuckGo today, but maybe I want Bing later or perhaps Google next time I do a search. That kind of uh, user selection needs to start happening with voice stuff because we're getting to the point where voice stuff shouldn't be branded and closed in and all of that. I would love a day where it's system level and I get to choose. Let's get there. I just uh, want to point out that uh, Sarah was able to say the name of Amazon's voice assistant without setting off my Amazon Echo. Mine well, either. Mine either. <laughs> Tom, Tom, give me a tip. He's like, just say it really fast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Facebook Messenger is adding controls to let users choose who can message them, uh, who goes into the requests folder, and the new option, who gets blocked from messaging you at all? If you're if you're tired of people showing up in your request folder, you can say they don't even get to show up there. Messenger will also experiment with blurring images sent from non-friends. So if you do want to accept non-friends, but you don't want to see what they might send you, just in case, uh, that's an option. Messenger's app lock feature is now official. App lock uh, lets you require fingerprint or face unlock before accessing Messenger. A little extra security. Uh, that feature is now live in iOS and coming soon to Android. Uh, do you feel safer using Messenger now? I no. mean, I am such a, like, we t we were talking before the show, I am either the luckiest person in the world or I just don't understand the UI. I don't get, like, Facebook Messenger spam ever. I get lots of other kinds of spam on a variety of platforms, but this is not a thing that I have been, you know, clamoring for, and I use the Messenger app pretty often. Yeah, I'm. I don't use it very often at all. I think it's because I just don't use Facebook that often. I mean, Facebook is a place where I go post something and then leave. But when I do go into Facebook, whether it's desktop or phone, I'm always a little annoyed because I'll see the little messenger icon and go, oh, "There's like a bunch of stuff there. Maybe I should check. Is it my mom? Like I don't know." So I'll go in there and look, and it'll be ten names I don't know. Half of it's spam. Super frustrating. I don't like it. So. If they're going to make it easier for me to, to not have to deal with that stuff and only go in there when I really feel like going in there or only going to get the messages I really actually want, like every service, yeah, please, more of that. Let's do that. Like that should be deep. We should have been doing this a long time ago. 
Facebook. Yeah, I used to be annoyed on the on the desktop version of Messenger when I'd see all those requests in bold kind of down below. Uh, but they've changed the interface. I, I haven't used Messenger as much, I have to admit. Uh, and and they're, they're buried a little more, so you don't see them as much. But I guess some people are like, you know what? I don't even want to know that there's a, a request folder that might have stuff in it. I just want to block this person from ever being able to show up. Because maybe, maybe you want to look in that request folder every once in a while, but you definitely don't want messages from a certain person. Uh, and so you could block that you know request from showing up or somebody keeps hammering your requests and you are somebody who looks at them uh you can block that person so you're not getting spammed uh, I, could, I could see uses for this uh and messenger is you know one of the dominant ways people talk to each other even if they don't use facebook for other things sometimes yeah Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com Crowd noise is being piped into stadiums for sports, which are in general being played without fans. That can make broadcasts feel a bit more normal if the broadcaster takes advantage. Korean baseball organization pipes in the noise for the fans, but you don't really hear it on the broadcast. Most you do, though. I've been watching Major League Baseball games with this piped in, and you hear it on the broadcast. They're piping it in there, and it does make it sound a little more normal. The sound that you're hearing is coming from video games. Premier League and Spain's La Liga have been using crowd noise provided by EA Sports. They had collected that for use in their FIFA games. Major League Baseball is using 75 crowd sounds from San Diego Studios. San Diego Studios is a branch of Sony Interactive, and they created the sound for Sony's game MLB The Show. But that's not all. Users of the MLB app can choose join the crowd in the app while watching a game. You can choose which team to cheer for in a particular game. Say you're watching it on TV and you're like, okay, Cardinals, Cubs, I'm choosing Cardinals. And then you have the option to boo, cheer, or clap just by tapping on your phone. What that does is compiles all the data from everybody using the app and watching the game and sends it to an audio technician who's sitting in the stadium with an iPad with those 75 crowd sounds on the iPad He'll see or she will see a graph of the fan participation from the app and can use that to guide what they play and how loud they play it. So you can't game the system and make it just constantly boo throughout the game because the technician will stop that. Uh, but the technician can take its cues from what's going on on the app. They can say, oh, all right, uh, looks like people are, you know, booing right now. They'll probably favor the home crowd over the opposing crowds if they're in that stadium, is my guess. But it's a way for you to feel like you are somehow having an impact on the crowd noise that you're hearing and make it feel less false. Uh, a few other Major League Baseball tech notes being being circulated. Each team's getting 15 iPads to replace shared video stations. That way they're easier to sanitize. You don't have people crowding around a station. Uh, Google Cloud is taking over from Amazon for hosting MLB stat tracking system StatCast, as well as some of the other features that are put into broadcasts. Sony 4K cameras and other upgrades are going to help get replays to umpires faster and cut down time spent reviewing plays. 4K doesn't make it faster, but 4K does uh, cut down on the time spent because you have higher resolution. You can zoom in on things. Regular season for baseball begins Thursday night, July 23rd with the Yankees versus the Nationals at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're even if you're not a sports fan, if you just want to see how all that works, you could check it out then. Yeah, I think this is cool. So um, we were talking about this on the morning stream this morning. You we were bringing this thing up, and I think it's very cool. I still have questions about how truly dynamic it is. If they have access to the um, the audio that comes in the show, specifically the MLB game, it is one of the most remarkable um, bits of sound work in sports video games. Like it's really, really good and very dynamic depending on what's happening in the game. And you can hit a, uh, a uh, foul ball and get a very different reaction out of the crowd if it comes at a part of the game where a foul ball is a problem or if uh, things are really intense, bases are loaded and you're about to possibly get a home run and knock everybody in, you get that foul ball, that crowd's going to be much more intense in the reaction than if it's early in the game, no score on the board, and you hit a foul ball. Um, I don't know if they're going to get that granular with this. It sounds like they're going to do some neat stuff, but I would hope so. It'll really make the game feel more real. I don't know how you achieve that without that weird feeling of pulling the camera out, noticing there's nobody in the stands, except I guess if you're a Rays fan, you get a bunch of cardboard <laughs> cutouts. Yeah, look at you, throwing the Rays under the bus, yeah. So, so yeah, like it, it, it on paper and in theory, I'm excited to see what this does and feels like. 
And Tom, you've seen some some pre season games did um, what did you think of how that felt even at that level like was it good was it satisfying like yeah no i, I as i said before like watching those preseason games with it in there it definitely made a difference it definitely made it feel more normal do you think that if if it's not mm, how do i put this like the other okay here's the other issue you hear a lot of players say well we like the sound of the crowd we like that it gets us going we get motivated and they'll be having that same experience and possibly the same disconnect by not seeing people but also, I wonder if it'll help them with things like shouting at each other, uh, different things they want to do. Like if, if a third coach. Yeah, in the Associated Press article uh, that we'll link it, link to in the show notes, it, it quotes a couple of of the players talking about how it was weird. You could hear conversations in the dugout of the opposing team while you were playing uh, before they started piping in that crowd noise. So it does seem to make a difference. I wonder who gets the audio tech job using that iPad to be like, all right, cool, man. <laughs> 75 people just tried to boo, but that's not what we're doing here. Um, that is, uh, that's a, that's, that's some God mode situation right there. I, I also think it's like, okay, in any given, I don't know. I mean, so I'm a SF Giants fan, right? So if I'm going and I'm watching the Giants at Pac Bell, it's mostly Giants fans. You get some other you know, opposing team fans there, just baseball people in general. So not everybody's going to be cheering exactly the same way. But yeah, you have that home crowd, you know, roar when, you know, something goes well for 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 that for that group of people. This changes the playing field, haha, somewhat huh. because because it's more of like, okay, here are the people that are interested in this game from all over the world, right? And want to participate in this way. And here's how we're going to make it a little bit more like what it would be like in real life, but it isn't real life. Yeah. Uh, so that's, you know, it's, it's, and it's not bad. I agree that if it was a silent game, people would be like, this is just weird. You got to do something. So, you know, what's it, what's it going to look like and, and how are people going to react? Yeah, yeah I, I should have pointed out, too, that it's the 75 sounds from San Diego Studios, but also customized sounds. So, Sarah, there will be on the iPad at uh, the, at, uh, the San Francisco Giants Stadium a button that says Beat L.A. that they can start playing. There you go. At any point. And you should and, just spam it. Just spam that button. Well, I was going to. Well, the technician will have that button. They should add that button to the app so that people can choose that or, you know, let's go right. Mets or whatever your local, right. you know. Yeah. It also hasn't been called Pac Bell in a long time, but hey, I'm a I purist. didn't say Pac Bell. I said the San Francisco <laughs> I did. Giants Stadium because I, I couldn't remember the name of it. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm like, it's just Pac Bell to me, okay? That's what is it is. Y'all know Park what I mean. still or did they change it again? I don't, I don't know. even know. Let's call it Pac Bell forever. Everything's I'm weird. What's up is yeah. down. What's right is wrong. <laughs> uh, if you want to talk about what's right and wrong, join in the conversation in our Discord, which you can link to uh, and join with a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Love to see you there. Let's check out the mailbag. We got uh, uh, some notes from David, who had thoughts on our discussion uh, yesterday with Trisha Hirschberger on deep fakes. And David says... The concern that's almost always raised is that the public will believe something is true when it's actually fake. You're looking at deep fake, you think, oh, this really happened, but it didn't. David says, but haven't the last several years demonstrated that the opposite is just as damaging, if not more? We seem to live in an era when someone can look at evidence that disproves a held belief and respond by lab labeling it fake, where once arguments were over what facts imply, now the argument is what the facts actually are. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if the first time a major controversy involving deepfakes was a person or an organization claiming footage was fake without any evidence supporting that assertion with the goal to create just enough doubt that supporters would then write it off as a hoax. Yeah, and uh, that's a fair point, David, but that also isn't changed by education. Uh, if you don't educate people about deepfakes, People are more likely to believe something is faked because they know deep fakes exist, but they don't know anything about them. So I would say that the Nixon project we talked about yesterday that aims to educate people will help folks understand that if somebody is calling something a fake that isn't, they will now know, well, wait a minute. Yeah, it doesn't look like a fake because I went and I learned what makes a fake and it doesn't seem like that's a fake. There are also other ways, you know, to validate whether something is fake or not beyond just the item itself. So it doesn't solve the problem David's talking about where someone can call something fake and get their supporters to cast doubt on it. But I don't know that you can ever solve that. That's that's just something that people are going to do on all walks of life is to deny that the point being made by the opposition is valid. 
Uh, I don't think that means we shouldn't be out there educating people about deep fakes and showing them what they are, because I think that will only help people to understand what they are and what they aren't. Uh, and what they can't achieve. And and you're more likely to get someone to go, wait a minute, actually, I, I don't think that is fake because I've, I've looked into this sort of thing and that well, would be hard to fake. There'll always be knee-jerk belief, but Tom's right. That kind of education will limit that and hopefully more people will recognize it when they see it. Uh, some people we'd like to recognize are patrons that are master and grandmaster levels, including Ken Hayes, Brad Schick, and Paul Boyer. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson. Scott, you've got some kind of good news, don't you? Yeah, we have good news. Uh, no longer will people have to hear me come on Wednesdays and say, hey, you should go support this Kickstarter. Tom and I, Tom and I started for <laughs> Current Geek Chronicles, a relaunch of the Current Geek podcast, and we did it. We nailed it. You guys did it. And thank you, everybody in the DTNS crowd who helped make that happen. We still have stretch goals. You can still get in uh, if you want any of those rewards. So it's not shut down yet. We still have a good week and a half or more to go uh, before this thing ends. But we did fun. That means the first episode of this new season that we've been crafting is out and available. You get a taste of what we've been trying to tell you we did. And it's, trust me, better than we can explain. We're bad at explaining it. Or the stuff's just so good, there's no way to explain it without listening. So go give it a listen. Everything's at currentgeek.com or if you want to check out the Kickstarter and all the information associated with that, find it over at support.currentgeek.com. Yes, too good for words. That's yes. what he's trying there, to say. There you go. Yeah. Uh, hey, folks, uh, there are a lot of cool things you can get in our store. One of them is a DTNS mask. Another one of them is a DTNS hoodie. You could pull the hoodie over your face if you want and wear a mask and put a DTNS mug uh, over your forehead. I don't know. There's all kinds of things you can do with the things you can buy in the store. Go check them out, dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. And if you have feedback for us, our email address to send that to is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you can join us live, please do Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, which is 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. I'll be off tomorrow, but Rich Strappolino will be with Sarah along with Justin Robert Young, and they will talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>